Uh, whilst the damage caused to individuals by drug prohibition is hard to ignore, perhaps less obvious is the impact of the war on the drugs on the planet. Our next speaker has come to tell us that the news is not good. Neil Woods is a former undercover police officer from the UK turned writer and international activist for drug law reform. He is chair of the European Law Enforcement Action Partnership, author of several books including Good Cop, Bad War, and a prominent voice in the global drug policy reform debate. Please welcome to the stage, Neil Woods. Wow. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, just before the break, Johan Hari was mentioned. Um, and I'm sure most of you have seen his TED talk. Johan has said to me on more than one occasion of, of Norway, he said, Norway's full of beautiful people. He said, it's a land of gods and goddesses. Now, I only need to look around the room to know what he's talking about, of course. Um, but from my own visits to Norway and the region, the wider Nordic region, my impression of people from this region is that you are thoughtful, intellectual. And so in about 26 minutes, I will be calling on that intellect and thoughtfulness because I will be asking for your help. But before I get to that, I should really explain what I'm going to talk about today. And what I'm going to talk about is how fucked we are. <laughs> so I'm really sorry to be the voice of doom, but unless we can end the interna international drug policy regime of prohibition, the planet is doomed. So that's quite a grand statement, so I suppose I better explain myself a little. I'm sure if we asked around the room, we could come up with loads of different ways how um, the illegality of the drug trade impacts on the environment. I'll, I'll give you a few examples. The chemicals used to process ephedra in northern Pakistan and Afghanistan, for example, is damaging the environment. The water extraction that is used to irrigate the poppy farms is turning Afghanistan into a desert. Um, there is the waste products from cocaine production. There is the waste products from the MDMA and amphetamine markets, which is destroying rivers and the, uh, the, the, the life in rivers in, in the Netherlands. I could go on and on and on. There's loads of them, absolutely on it, loads of them, not least of which um, the carbon footprint of drugs law enforcement around the, around the planet as well. I could go on, but all of those, in terms of the topic I'm about to address, are a drop in the ocean. They're almost irrelevant. Because the main problem that the regime, the drug policy regime is causing, is corruption. It's corruption. Now, it's actually really difficult to talk about corruption because in many audiences, People have such faith in their institutions, especially in the global north, especially in northern, northern Europe. We trust our police, as we heard yesterday. We trust our systems. And it's very hard to think in terms of the impact and the, 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 the size of global corruption. I can, it's difficult not to come across, actually, as a conspiracy theorist. But let me explain just how huge this problem is. And the, the reason it's such a problem is that we want countries to have good governance and we want them be able to be able to act on the treaties that they sign. But unfortunately, the deforestation pledges that were signed at COP26 and COP27, for many countries that signed those pledges, those signatures are meaningless because those governments don't control their own backyard. How can you stop deforestation if the gangsters control your jungle? And this is the case for huge numbers of nations around the equatorial line, that green band that surrounds the planet that is the most important part of the planet for the sequestration of carbon. So I really, I think I should start with explaining at what point I became so obsessed with understanding the nature of drugs organized crime and the corruption associated with it. And it began for me really at trying to buy uh, a large amount of crack cocaine from a gangster, like many of my stories start that way to be fair. <laughs> um, I'd been 
try, I'd been infiltrating or try to infiltrate um, a drug dealing gang out of Nottingham in the UK called the Bestwood Cartel, run by a very infamous UK gangster called Colin Gunn. And I tried for weeks and weeks to get close to him. And eventually I got introduced to one of his lieutenants. When I, meet, when I went to meet this lieutenant, he was, he was very suspicious of me. And he turned up in this car. And he turned up with his 12-year-old son in the passenger seat next to him. And the gangster, the lieutenant, was dressed identically to his son. They had the exact same two-piece tracksuit, the same Nike Air Max trainers, the same gold chain, the same shaved head. It was like his son was a mini-me. And clearly, he'd taken him along. Maybe I didn't know it was like, go to work with Daddy Day or something. But clearly, he'd taken, he'd taken him along to show him what, what he did all day. And what it turns out he did that day was stick a blade into my crotch. He, he placed a knife into my bollocks while he interrogated me. And I can assure you, having a knife there is quite off-putting. In fact, it makes conversation quite difficult. So he interrogated me. He was suspicious of me. He was asking me why I was there, who I knew, who had sent him to him. All of the, those kind of stories. While his son looked eagerly on. Like, what's, what's daddy doing? Anyway, eventually, he decided he was happy with me and I bought the drugs off him. And, I, and this was quite late at night, so I went back and I didn't have that much sleep. Um, and the next morning, we had an early morning briefing. And... Two of my backup team had gone off sick. So that morning after, I was introduced to two new police officers that I'd not met before. I was not happy about that at all. Now, when you've been working and living on your adrenaline for weeks and weeks and weeks, your senses become quite fine-tuned, to the, almost to the point of paranoia. And so I was suspicious of these two new people. I shook the hand of the first one. I had no problem with him shook the hand of the second one, and the hairs just went up on the back of my neck. Every fibre of my being was telling me that this guy was wrong. I could not trust him. So I went to the senior investigating officer, the guy running the job, and I said, look, boss, I cannot go out on the streets knowing that that guy knows what I'm doing, and I'm not doing it. He was great. He said, fine. We'll exclude them both so they don't know... Um, anything about it, they've not been in the briefing yet, they've not been told anything about the job, it's fine, we'll just run short-staffed. So I was happy then, and I put it out of my mind. The job concluded, about 56 people arrested, uh, I went on to another job. About a year later, I found out that that police officer I'd taken exception to, um, a detective called Charlie Fletcher, was an employee of, Car of Colin Gunn the gangster I was trying to infiltrate the gang of, which means he actually got closer to my inner circle than I did to his, which was particularly worrisome because during that whole operation, there was intelligence coming out that Colin Gunn was stating to anyone who would listen that if he caught an undercover police officer, that cop would be kidnapped, snatched off the street, taken to a very dark place and tortured to death. So I think I had potentially quite a, a near miss one of several uh, over time. Now, in the debrief for that, I spoke to many senior cops, and I've spoken to many since, but in the debrief, this senior police officer, the senior detective, said to me, well, Woodsy, we know this happens. Of course this happens. With this much money involved, how can it not happen? And that was the beginning of my lesson, really, in just how widespread the understanding is amongst senior police everywhere of the extent of corruption and the extent of the threat. And in fact, the systems that we have within undercover policing, certainly in the UK, and I do know it's the same in many other countries, are designed to protect against that corruption. So before I would go to any job at all, the team that would be assembled to, to support me would have to have nominated roles. I'd have to have an exhibits officer, I'd have to have an intelligence officer, SIO, backup. They'd all be hand-picked, and then be, they'd be told that they would be working completely separate from normal policing for the length of the operation. They wouldn't be allowed to speak to their colleagues. They wouldn't be able to log on to normal systems. They were complete like a cell, like a little terrorist cell. And the day before I got there, they would all be sat down and be given what's called a lawful order. 
And a law for order is a big thing in, in British policing. You've got to sit up and take notice. It means if you don't pay attention to this, you could get disciplined or sacked. So they're all to sign this lawful order. And the order said that when the undercover operative arrives, you will not ask them their real name. You will not ask them where they're from or any personal questions whatsoever. If you do, you will be disciplined. And that was to protect me from corruption. Now, the point is that those kind of systems, running an operation like a terrorist cell under pseudonyms, I was using the same pseudonym to my colleagues as I was to the drug dealers on the streets. None of those systems are in place for any other kind of policing. Only drugs policing. So the systems that are in place are in themselves a systematic admission of the extent of the problem. And as I've just explained, it still didn't protect me. He still got close to me. So I got quite obsessed with trying to understand how corruption works and the extent of it from that moment. And I read everything about organized crime, all of the intelligence that's available from around the world. I'm part of LEAP. I'm on the board of LEAP in the USA, so I'm privy to everything that comes out. But there are two interesting sources of information about organized crime. And as quite often, some of the most useful information actually comes from the prohibitionists. And there are two organizations. One is called Insight Crime, which is funded by the US government. And there's another one called the Global Initiative into Transnational Organized Crime, or GITOC. And they're funded by prohibition as well. They're funded by the European Union and various other political influences. But the thing is, what they tell us about organized crime is incredibly useful. The reports they do are so well researched, it's absolutely extraordinary. Some of the stuff that Insight Crime does on Latin America is, is just baffling in the detail that they publish. For example, Insight Crime did a study in Venezuela where they actually name the politician. They name the individual politician responsible for overseeing the cocaine transit in each of the Venezuelan ports. It's incredible information. GI talk have a, a, amazingly detailed reports from very skilled investigators and, and, and uh, researchers around the world. So their reports are brilliant. But it's like they present all this information and then don't come to the obvious conclusion. It's like telling a joke, but without bothering with the punchline. But it's not too difficult to read between the lines. But this is useful information that we, we, that we as a drug policy movement don't normally take that much notice of, but we need to. We need to understand the power of organized crime in order to be able to talk about it. One of the GI talk reports that came out in September 2021 was a brilliant piece of work. And it's clear, and I do know a few of the researchers, and they do get it, it's clear that the researchers understand the punchline all too well, but they're just not allowed to say it. But sometimes they sneak in some of the answers. And in that report, um, in, in September 2021, it said that the growing power of transnational organized crime is the single biggest threat to our security and our democratic way of life. The single biggest threat. Now, if you go to a climate conference, and a lot of people might say that the climate crisis is the single biggest threat to our democratic life and our security. But I'm here to tell you that those two things are the same thing. And they intertwine. So, so the, the, the punchline in this report, though, that some, some researcher got in there, and he must have... He must have been really nervous get slotting this line in, because there is a one-sentence paragraph in that report, and it says, we call for a global reset of drug policy, a global reset in response to this threat. How they got that passed, um, the, their masters, I've got no idea, but I was very appreciative of it. So it's in, in knowing this extent of corruption, we need to understand what's caused it and what is causing it, because it is getting worse with every passing year. And the reason for that is the cops. It's the police's fault, or rather it's, the, it's what we tell the police to do. So I'll, I'll explain the mechanism of how corruption has got worse. Okay, so say the police catch a heroin dealer who controls... Um, 
hard, this is very, very loose and theoretical, but a, the police catch a heroin dealer who controls half of the heroin supply in Oslo. The heroin dealer who is most able to take up that opportunity that has been created by the police is a dealer who controls the other half. So what we're doing by policing over time is we're creating monopolies or we create cooperatives. That's what we're doing over time. Drugs policing sharpens the sword of organised crime. It makes it more ruthless. It makes it more violent. It makes it more efficient. But it also makes it more monopolised. And this happens all over the world. So a good example is the Mexican cartels. There used to be a lot more different drug dealing gangs in Mexico. But now there's three super cartels. We've done that by trying to police drugs internationally. And those cartels have a bigger GDP than most West African countries. The most important, at the moment, supply route of cocaine into Europe comes across the Atlantic into West Africa. And to make those supply routes work efficiently, many of those countries have been corrupted in their entirety. And the reason that organised crime corrupts an entire nation rather than just an individual politician or a customs official is because it's more efficient. It's compl much more efficient. And increasingly, with every passing day, this is happening. We're looking at, at, the, at the downfall of Ecuador as a genuine uh, viable democracy almost on a daily basis. It, but that's already happened in West Africa. How does this impact on the environment? Well, if you've taken over a whole country or corrupted an entire country's political institutions in order to make your drug business more efficient, also means that that blanket corruption means that you can do any other crime as well because you've already paid for it with the drug money. So you can reinvest your drug money into illegal logging, illegal fishing, illegal gold mines. Whatever environmental harm, environmental crime that you want to commit, you can do now because you own the state. You've already corrupted the systems. But what's important to note is that all of those separate illegal activities, the deforestation, the gold mining, etc., there, is, there isn't enough value in any of those other criminal activities to take over an entire state. We call these narco states for a reason. It's only the value in the drug business that's big enough to take over an entire state. But once it's captured, you can do what you want with it. And there are very many tangible examples of, of, of the impact of that complete power around the world. But I'll give you a particular one. In Guinea, in April in 2001, the country of Guinea had the fastest deforestation, certainly in West Africa, possibly in the world. And then the civilian government, civilian democratically elected government, successfully stopped it. They shut down the, deforest, the, the, the logging companies and they said, we're going to take our commitments to the world seriously and we're going to stop it. And it did. It reduced it massively. September of that year, there was a military coup. As soon as that coup took over, Guinea again became the fastest deforester in West Africa, possibly in the world, in the space of a few months. The money, I believe, there is no tangible proof of this. I am interpreting intelligence from all over the place. I believe that coup was paid for by drug money and that Guinea is now entirely a narco state. In fact, there is a clear indication that the military took over merely to become the biggest drug dealing gang and to take the biggest advantage of the single biggest financial asset of that country. And you know what the single biggest financial asset of that country is? Money from the cocaine trade. The bribery. And now, no one is going to stop the deforestation in Guinea. Now, you can invite the Guinean government to the next COP, and you can point out to them, if you want, that, well, you signed, you signed to stop cutting the trees down, but you haven't done. They don't give a shit. The governance is gone. Now, if we look at other hotspots, we look at Conjurus. It's been a narco state for some time. We're obviously witnessing the collapse of Ecuador at the moment. And sometimes our opposition, prohibitionists, will say, no, this is nothing new. We've had military control and corruption in Colombia for a long time. We had the civil war with the FARC, and they're just a big bunch of gangsters. 
yeah, okay, we've all, always had destabilisation. We've always had military coups. It's an obvious colonial hangover. But no, this is new. This is new and this is recent. This is happening in the last few years. We have made organised crime truly transnational by our efforts to deal with drugs through policing rather than through health interventions. We've caused this. We've done this collectively. The National Crime Agency in the UK, they produce a brilliant report every, every year called the Strategic Assessment into Transnational Organised Crime. And in two of these reports in recent years, they've, they've made a brilliant analysis and conclusion that the money from the illicit drugs trade is routinely reinvested into other forms of criminality. Routinely. But what that means, really, if you reframe that, it means that the value in the drug market makes other crime possible. All crime. Now, we all know, you know, if you, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to start a business, you need startup funds, you need investment. So if you want to set up a people trafficking business or uh, a counterfeiting business, you can't go to the bank. But the value in the drug market are the bank for everything else that organised crime do. So, when you hear a prohibitionist, quite often a senior cop will say this, when they say, oh no, we've got to keep arresting drug dealers, because if we don't, organised crime, if we suddenly legally took legal control of the drug markets, organised crime would just go and do something else. No, that's bollocks. You don't create the opportunity for other crimes by shutting down the opportunity for another crime. You don't. Because where opportunities are already there, those crimes are already happening. Crime isn't caused by criminals. It's caused by opportunity. But what the value of the illicit drug market does, and bear in mind, it's the fourth or fifth, the, the whole of the drug markets together, it's the fourth or fifth biggest trade in the world. It's bigger than textiles. We're all wearing textiles, right? It gives you an idea of the scale. That is incredible power, incredible political power. But it's also incredible reinvestment power into other crimes. So it's an important piece of evidence and observation from the National Crime Agency, but we have to apply that to what's happening with the environment. To displaced people in the Amazon the land grabbing, the movement of drugs, which is, which is destroying huge, huge swathes of the Amazon. This is all drugs organised crime. But the reason that they can do that is because they have the power. And they have the power because they have the money. It is that simple. And we have to see this in economic terms. In terms of cocaine, there is something very dramatic going on. And there are news stories, not just in Norway, there's news stories in Ireland. I did an interview for Irish radio the other week. All over Europe, there is an increased prevalence of cocaine consumption and, and evidence of an increased demand. There is a rising demand both in Europe, Southeast Asia, all over the world for cocaine. In the last 12 months, the cocaine supply, the amount out there ready to be sold, has gone up 35%, according to... Uh, criminal intelligence, 35%. The wholesale price of coca leaves has gone down by 70%. This is dramatic. Now, there's lots of commentators speculating as the reasons why, but I don't think it's so complicated. It's just market. Transnational organised crime has, in the past, controlled the price of the wholesale kilo of cocaine in order to increase profit. They've done this for years. But the thing is, now... Organised crime is truly transnational. Organised crime groups in the Netherlands and the UK are now working with a, um, Italian, some Italian mafia. That would not have happened five years ago. It's, it's the West Balkans effect. The Albanians have forced everybody to become more cooperative. And this means that they have the power to decide to massively increase the supply. Because what's happened, it's now routine, normal, to get a cocaine, a gram of cocaine that's 100% pure. All the way down the west coast of the USA, British Columbia, Northern Europe, it's quite normal to get 
100% pure, which means in real terms, it's an incredible price drop in a very short amount of time. Now, why that's important is that this is not good news for governments because if organised crime are speculating on increasing demand further to make more money, then that mo well, we know now where that money is going to be reinvested. So there's an urgency here. So with that urgency in mind, about two and a half years ago, three years ago, um, I chatted with a friend of mine, Clemmy James, the brilliant Clemmy James, of Health Poverty Action, and we were discussing the details of this and some of the evidence. And we spent some time trying to work out what we, could, what we should do about it. And so we talked about forming a coalition, and that coalition now exists. Now, unfortunately, we have the rather clumsy name at the moment of the Drug Policy Reform and Environmental Justice Coalition. I, I, I actually forget it. Anyway, we, we, we are going to rebrand. We are going to try and find someone to fund a website. We are, there's lots of things to do. But uh, what we've done first is we produce a report. Um, and this report has been co-written by many people, um, including some brilliant academics like Kendra McSweeney from Ohio University, who's been producing evidence on this topic for the last decade. But we've also got lots of people from, from that are really affected. So we've got SOS Amazonia, we've got academics from Brazil, uh, Colombia, across the region, who have worked very hard in providing the evidence and the voice for this issue. So this is a new emerging issue for the drug policy reform debate. It is. This is the cutting edge discussion, and it's the most urgent at the moment, I believe. Um, so this report is out in a couple of weeks, and we decided to go with the report, rather Clemmy did. Um, it's her leadership, really. It's her, it's her work. She's brought the coalition together. She decided we would do this report first and see what, what support we can raise, what support we can get in order to then rebrand, do a website, and all of the other kind of outreach. But this report is designed, really, to be aimed at the environmental movement. Because we've tried to talk to the environmental movement. We've held events and we've invited them. We've tried to meet with them. We've met with someone from Greenpeace. We've met people from Global Witness. Uh, we've got someone from Global Witness on the, in the coalition. But we haven't organisationally got them on board. And, and there are reasons for this. One is that the environmental activist groups often don't want to be tainted with drugs. Dirty things. But we haven't got time for stigma. We haven't got time for squeamishness. They all need to realise that this is a significant barrier to climate justice. It's a significant barrier to what we need to do to save the planet. Possibly the biggest one. Because you can, you can agree whatever measures you want. If you haven't got a government, a government that's actually got the power to implement them, you're wasting your time and your resources. So we need them to think. So, as I said, I'm going to ask for your help. I'm sure amongst you, you will know somebody, or you will know someone who knows someone, who is an environmental activist, or who works in, those, in that sphere, or knows those people. I mean, someone in here might even know someone who knows someone, who knows Greta Thunberg. I don't know. I have no idea. But I need your help. So I'm going a few seconds over my time. Please forgive me for that. Um, so when this report comes out, please get a copy of it. I'm going to distribute it. Uh, I'll get copies to, to Doug Finn and Ina and whoever else wants them. Please get a copy of this report. Get it under the, new, under the nose of people who really need to be thinking about this. And let's join our movements together. Let's join those that are fighting for our planet together with our movement. And let's make the drug trade work for governance, work for the people and for the planet, and not against it. So, you beautiful people, thank you very much. <laughs>